It's of like precious faith. And God, is, it's hard to believe that it's been 17 weeks that we have stood here together and worshipped you. But Lord, there's so many that are not able to be with us tonight. And so many, God, that are still dealing with things that, of the unknown. And Lord, I pray that you would touch them in their physical bodies. Lord, there are those that need surgeries and procedures that we're having to be so careful that you would be with them in a very special way. And then God, tonight in this room, God, I know of some very special prayer request. And Lord, I pray that right now, God, that you would move and minister and may the anointing break strongholds. Father, we're fighting things demonically, Lord, that are getting in our hearts and our minds because of fear and anxieties and of the unknown. And Lord, tonight I ask that you would help us. In thy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, I want to start a little study. On Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, we've been going through the book of Mark. Uh, but on Wednesday nights, I'm going to do something just a little different. And so if you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 25. And I'm going to just kind of jump from Psalms to the New Testament and just share some things with you. Have you ever picked up the Bible and not understood it? I mean, I, I, mean, I mean this lovingly. Have you ever picked up the Bible and not understood it? Here's one of the number one problems that I find, and, and I'm going to just talk to you before we go to God's Word. When you find a person that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, some of the first questions they want to ask is tell me about Daniel and Revelation. Okay, now just hold on with me. They want to know about end time. They want to know about prophecy. They want to know about what's happening today. Maybe what's happening with the COVID-19. Maybe what's happening in their family. But I would love to know if somebody come to me and the first question they asked me was, tell me how to live for Jesus. Now you think about that. Most people that pick up God's word want to know the answers of the problems they're facing rather than that that is most important, and that's eternal life. If every new Christian would start their relationship with God reading the book of John rather than trying to figure out the book of Daniel or trying to understand the book of Revelation, they would be a lot better off. So let's kind of look at that tonight, and, and I'm going to use a word our words here in a moment that, that are interesting. Psalms 25, 8 through 14. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Now look very carefully at the next scripture. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek, verse 9, will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. I see people today looking at God's word and talking about how judgment is falling upon the world. And they're, they are trying to create, they're trying to make today fit in the Bible rather than them understand who Jesus is. And they're more worried about the judgments falling upon the world than they are the judgments falling upon them. Now let me make it a little plainer. Can I say it this way we understand it? The earth and the world that we know it is going to hell in a handbasket. That's according to God's word. We understand that. But people are more worried about what's going on with the world than they are what's going on with their own spiritual life. And what is happening here, he says, the meek will he guide in what? Judgment. When you start looking at God's word and you realize that there is heaven and there is hell, there's an eternal damnation and there's an eternal place to stay with God, and you start examining that not from the perspective that you're looking at it from the world's point of view, but you're looking at it from your point of view. 
Do I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior? Am I going to heaven or is my life not pleasing to God? And if so, is there judgment upon me? Then look at the next verse. Psalms 25 verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such that keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. Now here's here's where we're going to jump from, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. The secret of the Lord is with Him, them that fear Him, and He will show them in His covenant. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him and he will show them in his covenant. Now let me just translate that. The secret of the Lord is with them that understand where my personal relationship with Jesus falls. If I am going to heaven or not, and then when I accept that, and I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, then he will show himself in the covenant. Let me give it, a, give it to you a little plainer way. Have you ever tried to study God's Word and not be living for God? I'll go ahead and tell you, most of the time when we're studying God's Word and we're not living for Him, we want to put it down. We actually want to push it away. But if I'm living for Him, I find myself studying His Word to grow an understanding of Him. Now with that simple thought in mind from the Old Testament, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. If I love the Lord, if I fear the Lord, guess what I'm going to do next? I'm going to obey His Word. If I love the Lord and I fear the Lord, I'm going to obey His Word. And when that happens, the secrets of His Word then are start revealed to me. Now think about this with me a moment. If I don't fear God, God's word doesn't scare me. Do you know what scares me? What's happening around me. Now let's, let's be very transparent. How many of you in the last couple of weeks have for the very first time in a long time started looking at prophecy? It's a natural thing. We, we're, we're looking at prophecy And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we're taking a lot of scriptures out of context. And we're finding a lot of people that are taking a lot of scriptures out of context. And it's not because we fear God, but it's because we fear the unknown that we're dealing with today with some unknown virus. You understand? So my fear is empowered by what's in front of me than where I'm going to spend eternity. And because of that, I don't see the promises of the covenant. How many of you realize that Jesus said that he would take us through this? How many of you know that he is our blessed hope? How many of you know that Jesus said that we're not to have a spirit of fear? You you understand where I'm at? We're We're not... Fear is 365 or 367 times in the Bible. You you understand? So what's happening is I am basing my religious beliefs on the fear in front of me than basing my fear of eternity. I'm more worried about the economy. I'm more worried, let's just get real. I'm more worried about what's going to happen at school in four or five weeks than I am what's going to happen to my kids when they go in the car tomorrow to somewhere. You understand? So fear is causing you to forget the covenant that God made with us. How many of you realize that he said he would not leave us nor forsake us? 
but the fear sets in and we then start looking away from the promises. He said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, every you start talking about it. He said, I'll send the Holy Spirit as a comforter so that he can may come and be with you. So we understand this, but we're trying so hard to deal with what's in front of us that we're creating the Word of God as a mysterious thing and we're trying to solve what's in front of us rather than letting the Word of God speak to us and the things in front of us be those things that are unknown. We're trying to figure out everything in front of us and we're not trying to figure this out. Now you think about that a moment. We walk in light and not in darkness, but right now we're being led more by darkness than light. In the New Testament, it talks about the secrets of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 25, 14, the secrets of the Lord is with them that fear Him. The word secret in the Old Testament is a New Testament word that we find, and we don't find it in the Old Testament. It's called the mysteries. How many of you have ever heard of the mysteries of iniquity? The mysteries of sin. You know, we don't understand sin till it hits us in the face. I don't understand sin till I'm on this side of knowing Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Then when I look back and realize where I was at, I understand the mysterious side of it and the strongholds that it had against me. Those mysteries become realities when I look at it from God's word or from the covenant. When I'm living in sin and I'm living in the mysteries of iniquity and I'm living in, the, in those things that are, that are just not pleasing to God, I don't see it. I see the moment, I see what's going on around me, that the, but the moment that Jesus sets me free and the moment my eyes are opened all at once, I look back and realize that I was living in the mysteries of iniquity. How did that sin have such a strong hold of me? How did that alcohol have such a strong hold of me? How did those things have such a strong hold of me? Because that's how Satan operates. But we also have mysteries in God's Word. Okay? Look at this. We have mysteries and he explains them to us. And the word mystery or mysteries is used 27 times in the New Testament. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 starting at verse 9. Jesus is standing in front of his disciples. Disciples. Okay, now let's just really break this down. I, I want you to see this tonight as we kind of look at some things in the next couple of weeks. His disciples are who? Followers of Christ. He is revealing to them who He is. He is revealing to them the plan of what's going to take place. Are they stiff-necked? Are they hard of hearing? Are they stubborn? Yes. So what God does, Jesus does, is he starts revealing the plan to them and he starts talking to them. Now, what we find is parables. So here's the text that gets really interesting, Matthew 13, 9. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. Now Jesus says this. I didn't say this. Jesus says, the disciples ask him a question. Why speakest thou unto them, the Pharisees and all that are following? Why do you speak to them in parables? Why do you use illustrations? Why do you talk about farming? Why do you talk about different things? Why do you talk about laying seed and putting it in different areas? Why do you talk about it like that? And Jesus answered and said to them, Because it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. 
what he is saying to them is it is much deeper than planting seeds in the garden. Okay? When we use this illustration with children, we have no problem talking about how it falls on good ground, how it falls on bad ground, and how some it tramples and some it grows. We don't have any problem with that. And we can take a child out in the field and we can take him and we can say, now if you plant this tomato seed over here, it's not going to grow. They get it. If you plant it over here, it's going to do a little better. They get it. But if you plant it over here and you cultivate it and you put it in good soil, it's going to reproduce itself. And immediately, boom, they get it. But that's all they get. They get how to plant a tomato seed and how to grow tomatoes. So Jesus starts talking in very simple things that are right in front of them. Let me make it a little simpler. We have a virus that we don't know anything about, and we have some simple rules and regulations that we ought to be doing that we're really not doing. You understand? That's simple. We need to distance ourselves. We need to take I'm just using this as a simple illustration. We need to understand that this is something that's happening, and this is happening all around the world. Okay, to a person that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and is living for God, all they worry about is coronavirus. Boom. It's it. That, that's all they think about. But if you have a person over here that knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they look at this and they start realizing that their prophecy is being fulfilled. There's things happening in the spiritual realm that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against spiritual forces. And we realize when we see a falling away, we don't see this as, well, people are doing this and doing that. No, we're seeing some, we, we make a spiritual application to it immediately. I can watch Fox News with three different people, and if two of them are not saved, they will not catch what God's trying to say to you. You understand? They will see all the things that are happening and they'll see all the illustrations and they'll see all the parables about it and the moment you turn to them and say, that lines up with the book of Daniel. You just lost them. Because they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and they're not looking for that because they're looking to survive next week, next month, next year you and I are pilgrims passing through. We're strangers in a foreign land. So immediately when we see it, we see it as not the mystery of the world, but we see it as the mystery of God's Word that is being revealed to you and I. And I'll go ahead and say it, and I'll use it again in a minute, that even prophets, when they wrote it, did not even understand it. But now we're living to see it. It's the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's the mysteries of godliness. It's the mysteries of what God is doing. So the Bible says in Matthew 13, 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. Now here's why. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and she have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that that he hath. Hold, hold on. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they're seeing it, and they see not. You understand? They see it, and they see not. They're hearing it, and they hear not. Neither do they understand. All right, let's go a little further. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and not be perceived. For this people's heart is wax gross, their eye, ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with what? Their heart. And should be converted, and I should heal them. 
He literally says when you sit down and you talk to people, you're going to get two very distinct answers. You're going to get that one person that their eyes are blind and their ears are numb to what's happening in the spiritual realm. Do you remember what Jesus said? He that hath an eye, let him see. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, where it really gets interesting is when you, when you start talking about this, and we're all guilty of this, we then take prophecy that does not fit, but it sounds right, and we, we, we make a square hole, square peg go into a round hole, and we're going to force it in there, and God says, I never intended for that scripture to be there. I never intended for that to be there. And because of that, we now have everybody trying to be a student of prophecy. And the ones that are trying to be the student of prophecy the most are the ones that are not serving God the most. Hear me. They're not serving God, but because fear has gripped them of the unknown, they're trying to figure it out and they'll pull down and I can name all kind of books because I got a bunch of them and I can name different authors and it would just pull down and they're, they're going to pull down all these prophecy books and they're going to lay them out and they're going to talk about Daniel and they're going to talk about Revelation and they're going to be snatching it from over here and snatching it from over there and pulling it down from over here and you ask them one simple question and it blows their theology away. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? They, it just literally blows them away because that's not what they want to know. They want to know what's going to happen. Are, are, we, are we at the end of the world? Will the end, world end tomorrow? Will America be here when the prophecies are fulfilled? What's going to happen? We have a cashless society going on. When is the mark of the beast going to take place? I mean, all at once, all these questions. I mean, my goodness, you drive up to Hardy's and get a drink now and it says, please have exact change. That's here. So automatically a person that drives up to that that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior takes a picture of it and says, the end of the world is coming. And they have no clue who Jesus is. It's a mystery to them. So let's look at it a little more. You find in verse 15 of Matthew 13, for this people's heart is wax gross and their eyes are dull of hearing and their I mean their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted can I tell you what should be happening our nation ought to be dropping to their knees and the churches ought to be filled and people come screaming to the altar and then asking Jesus to be their savior let me make a very simple understanding of this so that we can see this. Prior to 9-11, the church was at an all-time low. All-time low. After 9-11 was one of the greatest short revivals that we ever saw. People come running to church, running to God's house, wanting answers, wanting to be delivered, wanting to be set free, wanting to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And then after that, they felt a little comfortable, things got a little better, and they fell away from God. And now this time, it just didn't last one day. It's not over. But now we're trying to figure it out biblically rather than coming to an understanding of who Jesus is. That's a dangerous place to be. So he stands and he's talking to his disciples. And he's also talking to those that are around him. And he says, blessed are your eyes for they see, verse 16, and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that now listen to what he says. That many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you are seeing and have not seen them and hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Now what is he talking about? 
He's talking about that Jesus came, the incarnate of Christ has come, and he stands before me and he says, if you see me, you see the Father. He also talked about how in the Old Testament they talked about how there would be prophecies, how there would be miracles, how the blind eyes would be opened, how the lame would walk. And Isaiah prophesies of this. Jesus said, Isaiah wrote it down, just knew that he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote it down, never got to see it, got to see great things. But he looks at the disciples and he says, not only are you hearing it, but you get to participate in it. You're involved in the very middle of it and I'm standing here in front of you and showing you the fulfillment of all the things in the Old Testament. The fulfillment of the Old Covenant is standing right in front of you. Now what's interesting there is they still didn't get it. They didn't see that till after he was resurrected. Then they got it. Because we know they went and we understand very quickly he, he appointed them, he anointed them, he empowered them, he commissioned them and they went to the upper room and they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then from there forward the church exploded. But prior to that, this is what they would say. Man, I saw him feed 5,000 yesterday. I saw him feed 4,000 a few months later. I saw him touch that man's lame that couldn't walk and can walk that man that was blind that can now see. I saw him in the synagogue as he touched the withered hand. Oh, Jesus, by the way, when we get to Rome, are we going to set your kingdom up this week or next week? You understand? They were there. They were involved in it but they still didn't see it. So Jesus is giving explanation to them. He is showing them the very mysteries. He's living the very mysteries out in front of them for them to see it themselves. And he is literally saying to them that in the parable of the sower, we must understand things that are there. And then he says something interesting to me. Go with me to the book of James. Well, matter of fact, Matthew 13, 18. Matthew 13, 18. Listen to what he says here at the end of this parable. Matthew 13, 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. This is he which receiveth the seed by the wayside. He literally says, and I love this one, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away. That was, sown in his, that was sown in his heart. This is that which receiveth it by the wayside. Have you ever, and I know you're all guilty of it because I am too, have you ever done what I call a rabbit trail? You get to studying something and you just keep studying. And, and let, let's say, for instance, you, you study the word tribulation. And you just study the word tribulation all the way out. And you know everything about the word tribulation. And then you, then you start studying the, the rapture of the church and you immediately realize that the word rapture is not there in Scripture, but it's all talking about how in a moment, twinkling, I will be taken out. And you study 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. You study 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. And... And you talk about the intimate return of Christ, how that in a moment and twinkling an eye, Jesus could come back and we need to get ready because everything's happening. And every day I wake up, there's all kind of things going on around me. And I know that Jesus is coming back. And the next day you get up and you don't even study God's word. The next day after that, you don't even remember the scriptures you studied. And then all at once somebody says something else about, and you go, yeah, I studied that. And, and let me take you back to 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, 53, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. I mean, you got them memorized. You know them. And you, know, and you talk about it and you talk about the, the catching away. And, oh, but the word rapture is not in the church. Then in a moment and a twinkling of an eye. And oh, by the way, there's an old southern gospel song I found and all this. And we talk about the intimate return. And then you even go this far and you say, man, that's called the blessed hope in God's word. And you talk about it. But all along, hold on. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. 
So the next thing you know, you lay that thought down or that scripture down or that study down. And so that that could have been something good, that seed that could have gone on good ground, then falls on, on ground that cannot. And before you know it, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was what? Originally sown in his heart, studied out, wrote out, and you can even go this far. Somewhere I've got a notebook about that. We have it plainly written out here, but it's not here. It's not applied to us spiritually. Okay? So we find it interesting. We must understand it. And so we're trying to figure out how to understand it before we do it. James 1.22 and 25. Now you know this scripture. Be you doers of the word and not studying or hearers or reading or buying the best book or buying the newest book on the end time are hearers only. Why? Look at the latter part of it. Deceiving who? Yourself. Now let me just say this. You walk up to somebody and you, you're talking to them and the mysteries of the unknown are brought up. The mysteries of tomorrow the mysteries of next month, the mysteries of what we've been going through the last few months, and, and they'll look at you and say, let me tell you what I found in this commentary. Let me tell you what I found in this commentary. Let me tell you what I found in that commentary. Now hold on. In the middle of that, and I've had this happen, and it was actually setting my office, and it was a few years ago, so I won't tell you who it was. In the middle of all this talking about end-time prophecy, I mean, they knew the scriptures Somebody called them on the phone and they picked up the phone and said, oh, hey, blankety, blank, blank, blank. Oh, whoops, I'm in front of the preacher. Excuse me a minute. And they hung up. And I looked at that person and I said, you are a hearer of God's word, but not a doer. You're a student of God's word, but you don't live it. That's what we're running into right now. You're running into a group of people now that know God's word, but they do not know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, that's the hardest one to win over to the kingdom of God. Because they think they know enough about God's word, but they do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And that's where we live in the South. So let's look a little further. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be what? Blessed in his deed or in his life. For he that beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. If that person that studies and knows and quotes the scripture, but when he looks at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. If I start growing in God, then I start understanding who God is. I went back to this very simple thought when we first started. I know a lot of people that they will sit down with you and if you ask them about their personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the first thing they want to talk to you about is the seven horsemen in the book of Revelation. I'll just tell you, that they, they just jump right there. They jump right into, 
They want to talk about the Armageddon. They want to talk about all that. They do not want to talk about their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And they want to know those questions. They want to have those answered rather than, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That if the Lord were to come today, would you be taken or would you be left behind? And I love that one because then all at once they look at you and go, which tribulation are you talking about? Which rapture are you talking about? I mean, immediately they know these things, but they do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Look a little further. Go with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. A lovers of God's Word will never find under the stand, understanding of the Bible impossible. They will keep digging till they get it. But the beginning point they get is their personal relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. When I find a person that has a hard time reading God's Word, I find a person that has not had a good understanding of what Jesus did for them on Calvary. When you sit down and you really talk to somebody and they come back to you and they're not talking about the Armageddon, they're not talking about the tribulation, but they're talking about the grace of God and the mercy of God. And they're talking about how if it were not for the grace of God and the mercy of God, they would not be there. And they'll come back and they'll look at you and go, have you ever read John 3.16? Because it jumps off the page. Do you know what John, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says? Because it's all about their relationship with Jesus. And when they start figuring out who Jesus is, then when they open up the book of Revelation, it's not the revealing of the end time, it's the revealing of Jesus. They don't look at it as the apocalypse. They look at it as the Jesus wins. And we're victorious through him. And they see it because they see that if they were not saved by the grace and the mercy of God, they would not have any right to be standing there. It's spirit inspired. It's spirit written. And it's spirit stirred. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. A born-again experience, or a person that's in love with Jesus, this is what you find. When they're transformed and they're, their heart is surrendered, this is what they're looking for. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. All at once, there is a life-changing moment. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all gall and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Do you hear what it just said? They lay aside everything they're angry about. All the hypocrisies in their life. All the envies and all the evil speakings and all at once. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, they now grow thereby. And if so be, you have tasted that the Lord is what? Gracious. You sit down and you listen to somebody talk and they'll tell you how good God is. They'll start with the simple truth, the simplicity of the gospel, and all at once the Holy Spirit just starts nudging them to dig a little deeper. And they start reading the book of John and they start understanding who Jesus was. They find themselves going back to the Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and, they, and they, they understand who Jesus was and they cannot help but go to the book of Acts. And then when they get to the book of Acts, they realize that there's more, there's more grace, there's more power, there's more available for them. And then all at once they go from drinking the milk 
And then all at once they look at the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts chapter 2 and it says that it would empower them, that Jesus would never leave them, the Holy Spirit would come and comfort them. And, and immediately their heart goes, wait a minute. I can live victorious in this hour in spite of what's happening? And it's all about trusting and walking in the grace and the mercy of God and understanding what the Holy Spirit has available. And then no longer do they feel like an orphan. No longer do they feel like they've got to prove themselves. They humbly come to God and say, God, teach me. And a humble and contrite and broken spirit, he will never turn away. He will not turn it away. And all at once, the Holy Spirit will start directing them to another passage. And they'll start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Have you ever put puzzles together? I remember the four-piece puzzle when I was a baby. Y'all remember that one? Well, somewhere in life, my dad threw a 50-piece puzzle in front of me, and it took longer than a day. And then one Christmas, I remember before I got out of high school, I got a thousand-piece puzzle that I never put together. What are you saying? In the four-piece piece of puzzle, you start putting it together and you realize who Jesus is. In the 50-piece puzzle, you start putting together and realizing what all he's done for you and how good he is and what's happening. Then when you get to the 100-piece, the 500, or the 1,000-piece, it goes from... Man, I, I can drink this, I can drink this, but let me try that. I'll never forget the first time I fed my baby something solid. Guess what they did? Spit it right back at me. Some parents will tell you, I fed my baby solid food at such and such month. Some it's a little longer, some it's a little less, it doesn't matter. But every one of us tonight... If I were to tell every one of you that you had to go on a 30-day diet of milk only, you'd walk out of here going, oh, my goodness. You want that Pepsi. You want that Dr. Pepper. You want that T-bone. You want that casserole. You want that deer meat. You understand what I'm saying? Why? Because you have experienced those things. Do you know what God says about his word? Taste and see that I'm good. He literally encourages us to spiritually eat a little more than what we're eating. Spiritually to understand a little more than what we're understanding. And as we do this, we grow. John 14, 26. John 14, 26. So the Holy Spirit is going to come on the scene. He's the one that wooed you to the altar, to Jesus. And we're, we're so afraid when we talk about the Holy Spirit that He's the third part of the, of the Godhead that we don't understand, but He's really the first one that dealt with us. He's the one that drew us to Jesus. None of, none of us would be here if it were not for the Holy Spirit. So we find in the book of John chapter 14, verse 26, 27, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Whoa, guess what he's going to do? He is going to teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. If this is a Spirit-inspired book and I am a spirit indwelt person that knows Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I start walking, like I said a few weeks ago, in harmony with this. And when I start reading it and I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, it's like I have moments I go, uh-huh, I got it. I get it. And all at once, where I used to have to make myself read one scripture, one chapter, now I have to stop before I finish one book because all at once the Spirit is drawing me. And then he takes scriptures that I've read 
and he remember, reminds me of scriptures that I read before. And I'm not asking anybody else. All at once, I'm starting to find it myself. And all at once, the mystery of who God is then starts unfolding. And I understand what's taking place because I start seeing it a little better. Rather than trying to make the book of Haggai and the book of Hosea fit in the book of Luke, I understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then when I look back to the minor prophets, I get it. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He will reveal it to you and He will bring it together. Look a little further. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. That's why some of you right now, in the last few months, all at once, you've been watching the evening news, and you will run, pick up your Bible, and you'll go look at Jeremiah. You'll go find, you know that scripture's in Isaiah somewhere. You know you heard that in Daniel somewhere. You know that you read that in Revelation somewhere. And all at once he starts bringing these things to your memory because it fell on good soil. You have a good, right relationship with God. And then what happens in verse 27? Peace. I leave with you my peace. I give unto you, not as the world giveth, I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What happens when you start reading the word that has been brought to your memory and the mysteries of God's word that you have learned for years and years and all at once you're in right standing and right relationship with God and you start looking at what's in front of you according to God's word trying to take what's in front of you and force it in the scriptures. You take the scriptures and you look up or you look around you and go, I see this through the lens of the Holy Spirit. And then all at once, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be what? Afraid. Then all at once you look at it and you go, man, I don't see that news story the way you see it. I see it as God is in complete control. I see it as I cannot wait to what he's going to do next. I see it as the unfolding of the end of the ages. I see it as an unfolding of the end time. And then all at once, hold on, the mysteries that was written by Isaiah and the mysteries that was written by Daniel and the mysteries that were written by the minor prophets, guess who's getting to live it and see it? We are. We are literally looking in front of it and going, wait a minute, that's not a mystery now, now let me say this to you, and, and I've got a few more scriptures I'm going to share very quick. The moment you quit looking at God's word from an American point of view and look at it from a God's word from a Middle East point of view, it transforms how you look at it. We're trying to solve America's problems rather than trying to realize the world has a problem. We're more worried about Choctaw County than we are Jerusalem. You hear me? The moment you start looking at God's word and you look at it from a perspective of the Middle East and you look at it from a perspective of how the Jews and Gentiles would see those things during their time frame. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't have that opportunity to study that. Yes, you do. You have the old covenant sitting right in front of you. History is his story told over and over and over and over. Can I prove it? Every generation had a stiff-necked people. Every generation had to deal with disasters and turn to God and then turn to idols and then turn away from God. So all you got to do is look back 
and see it as his story and watch the nation of Israel, watch as they rise and watch as they fall, watch as they're conquered and they're being conquered, watch as they go through pestilence, watch as they go through things. You look at that and you read those scriptures in the Old Testament, but then you read it from the perspective of what God is trying to say to you in the New Testament. And the mysteries of God's word then starts unraveling right in front of us. A little more. First Corinthians chapter four, verse one. First Corinthians four and one. Let a man so account of us as a ministers of Christ and what? Stewards of what? The mysteries of God. Now let me explain something to here very quick. The reason we're struggling in the hour that we're struggling in is because what was coming from behind the pulpit for so long was that we were going to prosper and do well and everything is going to be great and tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. Can I make it a little plainer? We were sucking ourselves right into the prosperity gospel. We were not preaching and teaching it, but we were living it. This is what was happening. I am rich and have need of nothing. And God says to the church, no, you don't understand it. You're poor, miserable, and blind, and naked. We created an atmosphere in, the, in, in America that we, we live in this cocoon that none of these things would ever happen to us. We'll talk about it in Africa. We'll talk about it in the Middle East. It, it, it's happening all around the world. But, oh, that would never happen to us. And then the moment it happened to us, the steward of the mysteries of God, us, that should have known what was happening and should have seen it and should have understood it, are now scrambling and trying to figure it out because the gospel message of the end time, of what's the revealing of Christ, had not been taught to us enough. There was a generation that used to say, and I'm very guilty of it, and I don't do it, as if it's the Lord's will, I'll see you Sunday morning. There was a generation that used to talk about judgment, hell, eternity. And so we quit talking about judgment, hell, eternity. We, t- we quit talking about how we were living a temporary life. And all, all at once we started talking about how we needed to live a prosperous life. How, yeah, you know, no, we were not preaching prosperity gospel. No, we, yes, we were, but we were preaching it a sugared down, coated part of it. And then all at once, when that is snatched out from under us and we're scrambling, the very thing that we should have had, we should have been able to go back into this say, at least a man so account of us as a ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Our business in the church was to understand this book so well that no matter what happened to me, I would have an answer. Every believer, you and I, all of us, should be lovers of the truth of God's word. Every one of us. This book, uh, hear me, this book will not save you. But living by this book, you'll have eternal life. Just because I have 16 books in my house does not mean I'm going to heaven. I I have to love the truth, and then the truth sets me free. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, verse 12. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Tell me if this doesn't fit where we're at today. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive what? Not the love of the what? Truth. 
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be what? Saved. And for this reason, hold on. For this very reason, God shall send strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned to believe not the truth because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They tell us in any given day that we live in the Bible belt. Y'all heard that. That we live in the most Christian society and that as a nation we're the most Christ-like society. Well, can I ask you a question? And this is a question that's just been digging at my spirit. What is all these foreign people looking at us and thinking that we trust in God so much and they're watching what's happening to us right now, how do they feel? They're reeling. They're rocked. Our nation is it at a place of chaos. Why? Because we did not fall in love with the truth when we needed to. Go back and read it. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie and that they should all might be damned and to believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Once I open my spirit up to things that are not of God or I add to or take away from what God intended to happen, it creates an atmosphere for the enemy to come in and change my spiritual DNA. And I quit falling in love with Jesus and I start falling in love and trying to figure out what's going on around me. Hello? That's the truth. We do this. We, we're, we're more worried about what's happening around us than we are our relationship with Jesus Christ. Isaiah 35 and 8. Isaiah 35 and 8, and I close with this scripture. And a highway shall be there, and a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. And the highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. And the moment I say holiness, you automatically have this mindset about that word. But can I say it in a way you and I can understand it? You are separated to be used by God. So that means that when you're sitting somewhere and somebody talks about what's happening today, what's happening next month, what's happening next year, you have been separated by the Holy Spirit and you look at it and you're, you're about to be used of God and they're going to be standing there and they're going to be spewing out fear, they're going to be spewing out doubt, they're going to be spewing out the unknown that because you understand the mysteries of God's word and understand your relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing, you'll look at them and you won't ask them what they think about end time prophecy. You'll look at them and you'll say this very simple statement. Where's your heart? Where's your relationship with Jesus? Because as for me and my house, we're going to serve God and we're going to be okay. And, and, I'm, and I can just go ahead and tell you, I'll tell you like I told somebody the other day, but if not. And they looked at me and said, what do you mean? Shadrach, Meshach is standing, going, standing in the fiery edge of the fiery furnace and turned to the king and said, if God does not spare us, we're still going to serve him. It's a mindset. 
that says, I understand the mysteries of who God is. I don't understand what's happening in front of me, but I know that he will not leave me, he will not forsake me, and he has not left me here, and he did not put me in a place that I could not walk through it. And all at once, the mysteries of godliness and then the mysteries of God's word and the understanding of God's word. We look at the iniquity, we look at all the false things and we understand and then all at once we look at Isaiah and say, we read it and this is what we come up looking at. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Because we see it as what Jesus said. These things must come to pass. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want to ask you a very simple thing. Are you afraid of more of what you're facing? Are you afraid that your life is not right with Jesus? If you're afraid of more of what you're facing and trying to figure that out, you'll never find the answers you need. But if you'll figure out your relationship with Jesus and where it needs to be, and I realize this is Wednesday night, but I'm telling you, if you'll get your heart right with God, everything else will line up. Scriptures align up, prophecy align up. It just flows because you're in line with the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, stir us tonight. Every one of us in this room have looked at your word and have talked about scriptures and talked about things and talked about the mysteries that are happening in front of us. Every one of us are, are looking at things in a way that we've never seen it before. But God, could we see it in ways that we can understand the mysteries of your kingdom of heaven? Could we understand that it's an unveiling of what is taking place and do we see it with clarity? And God, are we at peace? Are we walking by faith? Are we gripped by fear? Lord, I pray that you'll touch each and every one of us tonight. May we grow in grace and understanding and knowledge of your word. In thy name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? I want one more thing to do before we close. I want you to pray for your family. Pray for your family because you've had family members say some of the very things I've said tonight. They talk about end time, they talk about prophecy, but they do not want to talk about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, it's your desire that not one person perish. It's your desire that our husband, our son, our daughter, our wife, our children, our grandchildren, our next door neighbor, our co-worker find you as their Savior. That's why we're still here. That's why the church is still alive. And that's why you've still planted us where we're at. We're to be a light and a beacon in a dark hour. That's why God around this world you have a church that is rising up in spite of this. And you have men and women that are preaching the gospel and you're seeing souls saved and lives changed and families transformed because of that transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we stand in the gap of our unsaved loved ones. And God, we stand in the gap of those that have a head knowledge of your word but not a heart relationship of it. We pray for them right now. In thy holy name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Bless you.